Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining this webinar. Welcome to LMU's special international business lecture series. My name is Yong Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management and director of the Center for Asian Business, as well as the Center for International Business Education at the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. This program is funded by DK Kim Foundation, our generous benefactor of the Center for Asian Business for past four years, and also sponsored by the LMU's Center for International Business Education. The Center for Asian Business was established in 1995 to promote better understanding between the US and Asian countries through multiple channels, including international business courses, faculty research grants, student scholarships, special lectures and conferences, and also movie screenings. Today, we are very fortunate to have two great speakers who are knowledgeable about the intricacies of Asia Pacific market. Uh, Mrs. May Seifan and Mr. Jack Wang. Uh, Mrs. Seifan serves as the California Asia Pacific Chamber of Commerce's Vice President of Global and Domestic Programs. And she's also the director of MBDB, which stands for Minority Business Development Agency in Sacramento. Mr. Huang is CEO and president of Calway Foods. Dr. Francisco Valles, our moderator, will introduce them more properly later. Californian economy is closely integrated with Asian Pacific market. After Mexico and Canada, um, China, Japan, and South Korea represent the three main trading partners for the state of California. I'm sure that the stories our speakers will share today will inspire other small and medium-sized companies who'd like to expand their businesses to overseas market, uh, Asia Pacific countries in particular. Our program today is also meaningful as it illustrates a very timely and important initiative that LMU has been taking, particularly for past two years during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm referring to diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. MBDA is the only federal organization established to promote the growth and competitiveness of minority-owned businesses in the US. Most of these owners also happen to be immigrants. In fact, California is very much a hotbed of immigrant entrepreneurship. Nationally, about 25% of new companies are founded by immigrants, but that number increases to about 42% in California. This tells us immigrant entrepreneurs are making a great contribution to our economy. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator of today's program, Dr. Francisco Valle. Dr. Valle is a visiting assistant professor at LMU's Department of Management. He's president of VIA Consulting for more than 20 years, where he has developed and implemented integrated strategic and marketing communications plans for organizations looking for transformational market share growth. He's an expert on marketing and targeted for Latino and Hispanic population. Before he joined LMU two years ago, he had worked for well-known multinational corporations, such as BP Oil, Taco Bell, um, Aramark Corporation as a top executive or a senior manager. Uh, Professor Valle on a PhD in management from Claremont Graduate University's uh, Drucker School of Management. Hi, Francisco. Thanks for joining us today as moderator for this special webinar. Now, floor is yours. Would you please introduce our speakers and start your conversation with them? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peck, um, for your kind words of uh, welcome and introduction. Let me start first by thanking Mr. Billy Mara, the Chairman and Chief Executive uh, Officer and, and Chief Econ Connectivity Officer of ID IW Group for introducing us to Ms. Uh, Pat Pongo Kushida, President and CEO of the California Asi Asian Pacific Chamber of Commerce for making this webinar possible. We would like to start by welcoming all of you attending this webinar. 
Well, we believe that you are going to find this webinar to be full of valuable and thought-provoking thought, and thought information to all of you. Uh, as I say, we would like to start by welcoming all of you for attending this webinar. We believe that you are going to find this webinar to be full of valuable and thought-provoking information for all of us. After the presentation by our two guest speakers, we will have a Q&A session. Please submit your questions in the Q&A box and we'll address them then. To achieve the goals for this webinar, it is a great honor and privilege to have with us Ms. Uh, May Seinfeld. Ms. Seinfeld has served in various leadership roles across the public and nonprofit sectors since 2001. She brings extensive international experience in leading initiatives for the US government and international agencies in multiple countries across Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, and the Middle East. Ms. Seifang has worked for global organizations like World Vision International, Food for the Hungry, and the US Agency for International Development to advance economic development for communities in fragile and most conflict contexts. One of her career highlights includes working with US federal agencies to launch the first international trade export out of Kandahar, Afghanistan, in over 30 years after the onset of conflict. Ms. Seifan joined the Kyle Asian Chamber of Commerce in 2019, where she is the Vice President of Global and Domestic Programs of the Kyle Asian Chamber of Commerce. Ms. Seifan also serves as the Director of the Sacramento Minority Business Development Agency Business Center. She holds a BA in political science, global peace and security studies from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Ms. Seifan also earned an MA from Columbia University. We are also honored to have with us Mr. Jack Wan, President and CEO of Cal Calway Foods. Since its inception in 2008, Calway Foods has provided safe and high quality nut products, including pecans, walnuts, pistachio, almonds, and other agricultural products to China, Hong Kong, Japan, and South Taiwan. Calway Foods is headquartered in Santa Clara, California, with offices in Hong Kong and Guangzhou, China. In 2021, Calway Foods was recognized as a minority export firm of the year by the United States Department of Commerce, and, and the Minority Business Development NGO. Mr. Juan is um, a client of the Sacramento Minority Business Development Asia Export Center, funded by the United States Department of Commerce and operated by the California Asian Pacific Chamber of Commerce to help minority-owned enterprises succeed as exported. Prior to funding Calway Foods, Mr. Juan held a number of key leadership positions with several large or commercial banks, including Cate Bank, Heritage Bank, and First Bank of Trust. Before coming to the United States, he was a trade specialist at Wangdong Joy Holdings, an international conglomerate in China. Mr. Wang is a member of various uh, pecan grower associations and other industrial organizations. He's highly uh, active in the pecan industry and a frequent speaker at various uh, industrial conferences. Mr. Wang earned a BA degree in English and American Leadership and a Master of Science degree in Finance. He's also a graduate of Leadership Morgan Hills 2006. Please uh, join me in welcoming to Loyola Merriman University and his College of Business Administration, Ms. Sifang and Mr. Huang. May, uh, let's start the conversation with the following question. What does the Cal, Cal Asian Chamber of Commerce do? Thank you, Professor Va, and thank you for that gracious um, introduction. The Cal Asian Chamber of Commerce um, has been established since 2010, and so it has been around for a little while. 
And um, I can share a little bit in more detail as I go through my slides, but we essentially give voice to more than 600,000 Asian American and Pacific Islander owned businesses, as well as other minority businesses here in California. We are the largest statewide ethnic chamber in the, in the state of California, and our mission is to grow and strengthen the small business community. Um, I will, oh, can you go back to the first slide? Thank you. Um, I'll give a brief overview of the organization that I support, and that includes both the California Asian Pacific Chamber of Commerce, as well as the Sacramento Minority Business Development Agency, which is an agency out of the U.S. Department of Commerce. And as mentioned, the chamber was founded in 2010, and it has grown now to be more than a statewide chamber as we do operate several different um, federal as well as statewide programs. Next slide. The areas of priorities that we focus on include advocacy and policy. So we spend a lot of our time advocating for legislation and programs to help diverse small businesses reach new markets and expand their operations. We also focus and prioritize a very inclusive, equitable, and more resilient California. And we do that by providing access education and opportunities to enable small businesses to increase profits, connect to opportunities, and influence local and state policies. Next slide. We do not work on our own to do all these things. We um, work very closely with state agencies, which includes the Governor's Office for Business and Economic Development. It includes the multiple federal agencies that I mentioned um, including the Minority Business Development Agency, as well as Department of Transportation, Department of Agriculture. We also work with major corporations here in California to, to look at how we can diversify, uh, diversify suppliers for minority companies, um, or I'm sorry, diversify suppliers for state and federal agencies, as well as corporations needing more um, diverse suppliers to, to fulfill the contracts that they have. And so a lot of our work is done in coordination and partnership with other organizations that are within this economic ecosystem. Next slide. This is a brief overview of the impact that we um, have been able to achieve as a, a Chamber of Commerce and through many of the resources, services, and technical assistance that we offer. As you can see, we capture our, our work through number of clients served. We also look at the amount of loans and financial capital that our small business members can access through the services we provide. Um, we also capture the number of export transactions and trade that they um, have been successful in achieving year after year. Next slide. This next slide um, covers basically the network that we are a part of as part of the Minority Business Development Agency. We are one of three business centers located here in California. There are a total of 35 centers located across the US. And this map illustrates the various centers. There are four export centers and then the rest are specialty centers as well as business centers like ours. Next slide. The Minority Business Development Agency, as Dr. Peck announced earlier, is a federally funded agency under the Department of Commerce, and it is the only agency tasked to support the growth and global competitiveness of minority business enterprises. And it's towards this focus that we continue to grow and develop our services and assistance to support minority businesses. Next slide. And our center, the Sacramento MBDA Business Center, as mentioned, is one of three located here. So we have one down south where um, Loyola is in Los Angeles. And then we also have another sister center located in San Jose. And then ours is here in the capital. Next slide. One more slide over. 
This is just a brief highlight of the various different services and um, technical assistance we provide to businesses like Calway Foods and others who come to our center seeking resources and assistance. So we provide um, business development, both at the domestic and global level. We provide business matchmaking. We also um, spend a lot of our time providing help for businesses to access various different sources of funding that can be in the form of a loan, it can be in the form of grants. And so as more and more resources are being made available through the state and federal governments, um, there, there is an influx of various different financial streams to help support small to medium sized businesses. And the other area, as I mentioned already, is access to contracts. So we do provide um, introductions, trade lead identification, and global procurement opportunities to businesses that are seeking to trade overseas. Next slide. And this is a brief snapshot of the impact that has been made in the, um, in the industries that we service and the minority business enterprises who have been able to be assisted or impacted as a result of our direct assistance. I'll stop for here. I know I presented a lot of information in a very short amount of time, but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. You can go to the last slide. Professor Valle, I believe you have some questions for me or I'm happy to answer questions from any of the other participants as well. Yeah, yeah indeed. Um, thank you for this uh, great presentation. Uh, we can see that your uh, organization provide really a broad range you know, services to, to multiple type of companies. Uh, and, and in your case, you know, what is the main sector of industry that your clients conducted business with Asia participated or conduct business in? So the top five client industries, I would say, um, are represented by the services industry. So that includes different, it can be consulting, it could be financial services. The second is manufacturing. Consumer goods also makes up our top five. Construction food, beverage, and agriculture. Those are the top five industries represented by the clients we serve. And then the industries that we support as an organization, which isn't necessarily represented by the clients, but through our partnerships and other like-minded organizations, trade organizations, it includes food, beverage, and agriculture. So there's a bit of overlap. I think the one industry where there isn't quite an overlap yet is health and wellness. Wow. So, thank you. Uh, may I ask you a second question, please? Um, I'm sure that there are many people in the audience interested in joining your organization after your great presentation and explanation of all the benefits, including support and services your clients receive. What is the process that an interested business owner has to follow to join your organization? Are there any initial and monthly or yearly fees that your clients have to pay to join and conduct um, and continue to be a client of your organization? Thank you for that question. We have a couple different ways to, to get involved and join either our Chamber of Commerce as a member or to become a client of the MBDA Business Center. Um, to be a client of the MBDA Business Center, we have an online intake process, which I'd be happy to share the link in the chat box. And then to be a member of the Chamber of Commerce, we have a team that will reach out to you. So I suggest um, utilizing the contact details I posted in that last slide, which I believe you'll get a copy of the presentation after today's event. And please feel free to reach out to my team and me and someone will follow up to assist you. Yeah, so thank you. It's, um, so, but it seems like it's an easy process to follow, you know, to become a client. We try to make it as easy as possible since the work that business owners have to, um, to engage in are challenging enough in of itself. Our, our goal is to make everything as streamlined and easy as possible because 
the journey of being a business owner is a hard one. It's a challenging yeah. one, but also as you'll, you'll hear soon, um, it's also a rewarding one. And we're here to support that process. Well, that's great because um, I have worked with several small business owners, right? And they are afraid sometimes of joining an organization like yours. They feel that they're too small for this. Uh, there, there are a lot of smaller micro enterprises is what we call them, micro business enterprises or even pre-venture who come to us and maybe they're not quite ready. So the slide I showed earlier with the ecosystem of centers and programs, we, we have series of support that um, directly targets those who are micro or pre-venture. So, so we understand that and um, we do our best to simplify the steps and also to, to try to relate the services and make them relevant for the needs of business owners of all yeah. sizes. Thank you. So now let's turn it over to Jack. If I may ask you some questions. Um, first, let, let me start by congratulating you and Calway Foos for being named the 2021 Minority Export Firm of the Year by the United States Department of Commerce and the Minority Business Development Agency. This is uh, certainly a highly prestigious achievement, okay? So let me, st let me start by sharing a video about your, your organization, Calway Foods. Marky? Mi nombre es Daniel. Me gusta trabajar aquí. Aprendo cada día algo más. Me dio el don de tener manos. In the beginning, I really knew nothing about pecan. In fact, it was an accident. I was actually a banker before we started Calway Food. Now, one of my customers at the bank, he was buying and selling pecan to China. So he came to me and said, I don't speak Chinese. Would you like to join me? I jumped on it and I started Calway Foods. I'm the president of Calway Foods based in Santa Clara, California. Harvesting pecans is a lot of work. There is a lot of love that goes into it too. Sometimes we like to say the labor of love in growing and harvesting pecans because you really put your heart and soul into it year round. It is a farm to table product that, you know, is, is the livelihood of all of our growers. China is a uh huge country with 1.4 billion people. And when we first started, they didn't know much about pecan. And I look at this and I thought that was an opportunity for me. So we started shipping pecan to China. Calway Food has been in business since uh, 2008. So our revenue continued to grow. And in just the fifth year, our sales hit 16 million. I think the number one question that people ask me is that I have the best product, but how come I cannot sell my product to China? Culture is a big obstacle for most foreigners entering the Chinese market. Language is probably easy. You can just hire an interpreter and you can get your message across, but culture really takes time. MPTA has been a great partner for Calvin Food. As a small business owner, you are gonna do a lot of things by yourself. Uh, they provide a lot of services to our company, including government regulation, market data, or market development. They are a group of professionals who are not only willing to help you during a good time, they stay with you during the difficult, challenging time like now. I think without MBDA, we wouldn't have accomplished that much today.
Like, um, this is a, a great story, you know? And uh, you, it, it sounds like you make it look easy in this video, but I know that that's not the case, you know? <laughs> so the question I have for you is, what's, what is the most difficult issue that you face and had to deal with when you started your business? Oh, hi, Dr. Val. Th thank you for uh, having me here today. Thank you so much for all of you being here. Uh, it, it was a, such a, it's such a great honor to be part of the program sponsored by such a prestigious uh, university. I just checked your ranking and you are the number 12 in the whole nation. And so I'm, I'm very impressed. And, and so, um, yeah, I mean, the when I first started a company, the most difficult thing I thought at the beginning uh, would be capital, but uh, it turned out to be not that hard <clears throat> because I think most people think, you know, starting a business required a lot of capital, but I started a company with just $5,000. Uh, and, but when I first started my company, I already have uh, a lot of experience uh, working with an international trading company, uh, working with a bank in the banking industry for 10 years, which gave me uh, a lot of training in trade finance inside. My work at an international trading company in China also gave me, gave me the opportunity to learn every aspect of an import export company. And that was a multinational corporation in China. And uh, I picked that job with the intention of learning and improving myself. And hopefully someday I'm gonna start my own company. Uh, so, so, you know, I, um, uh, when I first started, then uh, we had no capital, but then I talked to my uh, client at the bank and they were very interested, you know, um, you know, I had a lot of customers uh, in the bank industry and they trust me a lot. And uh, I believe, you know, if you have a good story to tell, uh, if they trust you, if they're confident in what you're doing, I think raising capital is pretty easy. And so they loaned me 150,000 and here you go. I started my company. We started shipping pecan to China, turn over that money, and slowly but surely, uh, we gained more and more customer. We increased our market share in China, and we, at the same time, we increased our supplier base in the United States. You know, that helped us to generate a lot of businesses on both sides. And so, you know, it, it seems to be difficult, but, but it, it's really not rocket science, and this is something that uh, can be done. And I think, um, you know, the most difficult part is, in fact, uh, it's really not a capital uh, in international business. I think the most difficult, the challenging part is understand the culture of the country you are selling to. So that really takes time. So the number one question that people ask me is, Hey, I have the best product. How come I can't sell my product to China? It's really not about your product. It's really about, you know, how much you understand the culture. The language is not even a problem because you can easily hire an interpreter and you can communicate and get your uh, message crossed. And so now let me show you um, my uh, slide. Uh, there's so much I wanted to talk about, but, um, because we ha just have limited time, uh, you know, we're gonna we we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna focus on uh, a, a few things. Uh, most importantly, the culture. And so, yeah, here is my slide. I'm gonna use my slide as a a, a guidance. I'm not gonna use it too much. And so. Uh, Okay, are you able to see my slide now? Uh, okay. Okay, now, um, <clears throat> uh, here, here's my uh, 
contact information, my email, my cell phone number. Uh, if you have any question or comment after the meeting, feel free to re reach out to me or Dr. Val after the meeting. And uh, so today we're going to focus on a couple of things. Uh, number one, we're going to talk about international marketing. Okay, the big part of that is how to identify and define your market, how to choose your product, and what are the opportunity and challenges. Okay, number one, target market. How do we define and find our target market? You know, first of all, we need to look at, you know, there are only two approaches. So number one, top-down approach. The top-down approach means I just want to target to China, Vietnam, or Singapore, or Europe, uh, whatever market you want to go to. So, and then we're going to find out what the market is, and then we're going to find the product. And so that product tailors specifically to that market. And the second approach is, is what we call the bottom-up approach. We just find the product first. I have this best product. I'm going to sell this product to whatever market that fit into uh, the requirement. And so, you know, we chose China because number one, the size of the market, and number two, uh, it's the knowledge about the market. So typically, when you go to a market, you want to go to a market that you know really well, you uh, understand the market, you have the insightful knowledge about the market. For us, this is a natural choice because I was born and raised in China. And my family been there forever. And so that is a, a natural uh, selection for us. And the size of the market, China, of course, is a huge market. So we got 1.4 billion people with uh, 300,000 middle-class consumer. So that number is even larger than the total population of the United States. And so that is a, a, a great market for us. And so when you look at other, other demographic data, uh, China is also the second largest automobile market and also uh, the largest uh, luxury good market. And, uh, you know, the Chinese people like shopping and you're never going to run out of them. And, uh, you know, this is a, a massive market for Western company. And so when, uh, so this is a the market, uh, then, then how do we decide what we sell to that market? So for the product, uh, there are also two approaches. Number one is uh, the market oriented or product oriented. Market oriented means um, whatever the market is, I'm going to sell that product to that market. Yeah. And then um, product oriented means, you know, I, I just, I don't care what you need, but I just wanted to, you know, sell my best product, you know. Uh, so for us, typically, uh, the market-oriented approach certainly is the one that we use. You know, we sell pecans just because China does not, does not have any pecan and they can't grow pecan. And so that, because of that, we enjoy absolute advantage over other uh, products. I think it's important to choose the right product to sell to a market. Opportunity and challenge, we're going to go over a little bit. Okay, um, as I mentioned before, language is not an issue. The most complicated and challenging aspect of doing business overseas is understand the culture of the home country. Whatever country you come from, Turkey, Russia, Ukraine, uh, if you want to go after that market, you need to understand the, the culture. You cannot understand your customer without understanding the culture, right? Um, so, in China, we look at the core value of our consumer. Number one, happiness. They want to be happy. Number two, they want to be wealthy. They want to have a lot of money. Number three, they want to long, live a long life. So pecan, all, all pecan and pistachio, all these nut products fit into that category. In China, also, the relationship is something that we cannot ignore. And most people think, uh, they can go to China and make quick money. That is not the case. Uh, relationship 
is the most important thing in business dealing. In China, people really, you know, don't start doing business with you until they trust you. And so what we call Guan Xi, so that is a big part of that. Uh, some of the business protocol uh, we need to pay attention to, for example, usually we, when we meet your customer, new customer, you hand out a business card, right? And so for us, we just use one hand to hand a business card to your customer. And, and that's it. When people give you the business card, you, you just put it in the pocket. So that's not the right way to do it. And I think the better way to do it is you hand your business card to your customer with two hands and call them by the um, title. For example, Manager Chan, President, President Zhao. That you uh, respect them, uh, they're important, right? And so when you shake hand, uh, in, the, in here we always give people a, a, a firm handshake, but in China, <laughs> too firm is not the, um, it's not, it's not the right way. And uh, you don't want to squeeze people's hand. They consider that as, uh, they don't feel comfortable, right? Uh, even probably is an offense. That is a big difference. And a lot of us don't know about this. Uh, when we choose a game, uh, here we always use white and not a color. So in China, don't use white wrapping because people only use white color or a funeral or something else. And so go with a red or blue or, or green. Uh, when you use red, you're not gonna go wrong because red means lucky, right? And um, uh, when you go to China, they normally, they don't talk about business right away. They take you to dinner, lunch, or parties and stuff like that. Uh, when you go to, um, when you go to dinner, typically you're gonna talk. And, and also I suggest that you choose a topic, you know, wisely. Try to avoid political subject. And uh, so, you know, especially in the first meeting. And uh, when, when they pour tea, uh, you use a finger to tap on the table. That means thank you, right? And when you toast, uh, you hold your glasses lower than the other part. I mean, you are respecting him or her, and she or, or him is superior than you. And so uh, we just talk about a product strategy. And now here's his example. You know, there is a saying, somebody else, somebody's strategy could be somebody else's treasure. You know, this is an example. We never thought, you know, chicken feed is going to be a food. You know, this is something that we always pay somebody the hallway. But in China, this is a, a delicacy. Uh, people pay a lot of money. And so when we look for product, you want to look for product, not just something that you like. You look for product that your customer may like, sometimes going to surprise you. And how can it be possible that chicken feed are three times more expensive than chicken? You know, chicken, we're talking about 80 cents a pound, but chicken feed, we're talking about 350 a pound. So all the chicken feed in the United States are bought up by Chinese company. And at the beginning, you know, those lot of houses need to pay them, pay the hauling company to haul them away. But now they make tons of money by selling those to China. That gives you an example of how important it is to understand the customs, the culture of your, your customer's country. Of course, here's another one. This is maybe a little extreme, People eat snake there, right? You never thought about that. You know, here is the live snake, and the, this is what it looks like when it is done. It is delicious. It's also expensive. And in Chinese New Year, we typically get um, red envelopes. I mean, gives you good luck, and uh, especially for those people that are not married, you always get an envelope when you meet. Uh, people who are senior than you, uh, when you go to family and stuff. So in this case, if you need to get your envelope, you, know, you need to drink the first cup of wine first, beer, um, and then you can get the envelope. That's a fun way to do it. Yeah, this will only happen in China. They, need, they, they know how to balance their life. Yeah, look at this guy, he can carry like four big vases in his, his bike. Entertainment.
This is how people do entertainment in uh, in the village. They play car, they're having fun. And no matter you know, they have the money or not, they're having fun for sure. Okay, look at this. Look at this lady. She works so hard and carries so many bowls and dishes. Okay, when they cut hair, they use something like this. They never waste the money buying a, a trimmer or something. They use the knife that they use for harvest. Okay, so much for fun. But now let's go back to business. Um, in the business dealing, in, and China is a huge country. And uh, China, it, it takes time to build a relationship and to, to uh, grow your business over there. China, it, it takes a lot of patience. Uh, you, you won't be able to make money overnight. So we just need to be patient. And uh, sometimes uh, when we talk to customers and the Chinese tend to be very polite and they don't say no, they say yes. Uh, but here we are straightforward. When we say, hey, this is this good? You want to sign a contract or you, you like this product? And they always say yes, because they don't want to offend you. Uh, but the problem with that is uh, being polite is you don't really get to know what the customer's real concerns are, what they really need. So at the end of the day, you can't do business. And that's what uh, our you know, business counterpart our, or our competitor go to China and uh, what they told me. They said, yeah, let me think about it. You know, the key thing is, uh, but when I sit in front of them, they always complain a lot. They tell me what's not right. The, the, the price is high. The, the quality is not there. The delivery is late. But the key thing is, I am able to get into the heart and mind of the people that I do business with. Uh, so they, they, in another word, they trust me, okay? If they don't complain, that will be a problem. And so, um, so you need to let them know that you don't tell them you're the best. You don't tell them you have the best product. You tell them, the message you want to tell them is you are the one to do business with. Right? And so they do business with me, not because I'm good looking, although I think I am. My mom said that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> they just need to see value. If they don't see value, they're going to stay away. They're going to continue to be polite. And so what is not spoken is more important. What they tell you sometimes may not be speaking from the mind. Right? So just be a good listener in international dealing. So that is the most challenging part for the Westerner. And uh, so, okay. So what do they look for? Right? A consumer, a buyer, they look for people, the product and price. Okay. When I say people, it means the people who would, they want to do business with. Once they trust you, they can do a lot of business with you. If they don't trust you, there's no way to start. All right. And so that's important. Product is secondary simply because they believe if the people are right, the product is going to be right. The price is going to be right. And so that's how we, we grow our business in China. And uh, even those multinational corporations, they go to China, they couldn't get into the customer base that we have. Right now we have 70% of the top 10 customer in China. And so, um, you know, again, it's not because of my good luck. It's just because, you know, we are able to gain the confidence. We were able to convince them that we are the right one to do business with. Uh, I'm going to skip that and uh, I'm going to leave some time for questions and comments. So. Thank you, Jack. And uh, I apologize, based on what you sh share with us, I'm committing a bad manners by calling you Jack and calling you man. Oh, you know? no, no problem. I should, <laughs> I should call you Mr. CEO or President, you know, Jack. Oh. Ron, and... <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, uh, I want to be a student again and go to your class someday. <laughs> yeah. I actually, you just remind me, you know, with your presentation, when uh, we were, I was with Taco Bell and we were introducing products into Australia, you know, we brought our famous hot sauce, you know, from Taco Bell. And in Australia, oh. they laugh at us. 
because they wanted something that's spicier. So uh -huh. we have to develop what is called now the fire sauce, you know, because culturally they are used to having really, you know, tasty hot, really hot, you know, sauces. So our American sauce was not good enough. Uh -huh. So uh, <laughs> thank you. No, but uh, knowing what you know now, you know, what would you have done different? Uh, I think that's a great question. And uh, I think what I would like to have done if I were given a second chance to do it again, uh, we have been in business uh, for 14 years and uh, always have been in the wholesale business. Uh, you know, we grew from zero to 16 million in just four or five years. And that was tremendous growth. And uh, that was not because we really wanted to grow that fast. And we were, in fact, was was, was, was forced to grow. Uh, when you deal with a, a, a big market like China, the customers always want more product, more product, more product. If you can't uh, meet their demand, they will go somewhere else, right? And so, uh, so that is a problem and that's a good problem. And uh, so that means we're doing a good job marketing our product to China and uh, we, we have the confidence. And, and so um, uh, I think if, if I would had a chance to do it again, I may have uh, set up a, a processing plan that allow us more flexibility of producing more product instead of subject ourselves to our supplier. And so that's one thing. And second thing is uh, uh, we would have uh, developed our own brand. Uh, you know, right now we don't have our brand. I think brand is a, a, a variable intangible asset on your balance sheet. Uh, the longer your brand has, the more money you're gonna worth, right? And so without a brand, statistically is dangerous. And so in the next couple of years, uh, we are gonna develop a brand and uh, uh, produce a retail pack and market directly to the consumer base. And right now we are all selling our product to uh, big customers in China, the top 10 customers, including uh, Free Squirrel, uh, the e-commerce platform, uh, supermarket, and uh, big importers. And so uh, we have the volume that our profit margin uh, maintain at a uh, certainly uh, a lower level. But going forward, we would like to increase our profit margin going forward. Yeah, yeah Mel, thank you. Great, great advice. Now, let yeah. me, let me uh, start with some questions from the audience, you know? Tom, we would like to know what resources do you use to find customers for your product in China? Okay, so how do we find our customer in China? Yes. Okay. Uh, you know, at the beginning, I thought it's difficult. You know, I think I, I was concerned about it, but, you know, the key thing is do it. Uh, you know, you got to start somewhere. And you, you know, when you when you think your passion is something that is you're passionate about, when I first started my, my company, we had only one customer at that time. That was one of the top 10 customers. Uh, but this guy, trust me, and uh, he even provided me some upfront capital to run our business, which is great. And so, um, you know, the way to find your customer is, uh, network with your customer and uh, they refer customer to YouTube and go to conferences and go to trade show. We go to China every year in May. Uh, that's a big trade show. 150,000 people uh, will come to the trade show. And uh, uh, also you do some marketing uh, and, and the best way to do it is, is, is show your product, meet with customer uh, face to face. And I travel quite a bit. I go to Europe, China, Hong Kong, I meet with customers, sit in front of them. And so, you know, the Chinese people always like the kind of interaction. They want to ask questions. They want to see how you're doing. Uh, are you, are you, are you familiar with the product? Are you, are you, um, are you good, uh, in your industry? So, you know, at the beginning, I really didn't don't know too much, but, you know, for our approach, you know, but product knowledge is, is pretty easy. Uh, I think it's, it takes you one or two weeks, you can become an expert, so don't worry about it. And so what you really need to have is the knowledge of input and export operation, this procedure, the financing side, and uh, uh, most importantly, uh, I think most of the, the our, uh, our, our businessmen focus more on themselves. Uh, we're the best company, we're the, we have the best product. I don't, I don't think for us, we're going to use that approach. Uh, our approach mm -hmm. is to focus on your customer, really right. 
get into the heart and mind and what the concerns are, what, what they really need, and so you can help them. Uh, if you can add value to the business, no matter they're big or small, they're going to follow you. They're going to trust you. They're going to give you a lot of business. Yeah. And so well, you do it one at a time. And so one by one. So, so right now we have a, a portfolio of at least, you know, more than 100 customers so far. Yeah. So you're talking about that you have to really become like a partner and a member of the family, right? Yeah. Culturally, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you you get to know them and and they got to know you. Uh, so it, it, it takes some time because of a similar background, right? I, I yeah. was born and grew up in China, and uh, we speak the same language, we, we have the same joke, and, and we laugh the same thing. And so yeah. it's so much easier for me to talk to the customer and uh, you know, for, for, for people from here who don't know the culture, it takes them week months or even years to close yeah. the deal but for me yeah. in most cases um you know we got we built a good report yeah. right away and we can close deal in 15 minutes and half an hour yeah thank you yeah now we we have another question for uh yeah. from brian uh he would like to know how does the current lockdown in china affect your sales yeah, absolutely. The lockdown will impact the supply chain and also, you know, on both the consumer market as well. And uh, the shipping problem, we all have all the ships uh, floating on the water, waiting to dock. And we still have some containers floating outside the uh, 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 Shanghai and Tianjin. And so that delayed the collection of the payment, um, you know, temporarily. But I think eventually when, when this uh, COVID thing is up, I think it's been getting back to normal. And so mm -hmm. the COVID, the, the trade war and everything all have an impact on your operation. Uh, all you need to do, it, it doesn't mean you can't do anything. You know, there are basically two types of risks. One is the market risk, which is uh, systematic, right? Something you can't really do too much about. Or number two is non-specific, your company's operation. You don't want to, uh, so this two types of risks. And you want to think crisis in the best time. And you want to think the best when you're in crisis. Last year, we had our, our, a record year. Uh, and we doubled the sale from 2020. So, so, so you, all you need to do is, is maintain uh, optimistic. You know, you've got to prepare. You've got to adjust. You know? yeah, yeah. Uh, always something happened. You know? Right. Either trade war, or COVID, or hurricane. Yeah, you got to yeah. prepare for it. You have to be prepared for all yeah. Yeah. circumstances. You know that. Yeah. Now, one student would like to know what advice do you have for a student who wanted to acquire a new language? Uh, you mean what specific language you wanted to acquire? Or, Let's say or? Chinese. Yeah, like oh, you didn't want okay. to learn Chinese. Oh yeah, I mean. Uh, it, uh, you know, Chinese is a popular language if you are interested in going after the, the market in China. I think Chinese is probably a good language for you to, to learn because uh, people feel warm and, and friendly if you can speak some Chinese. Even you say ni hao, they feel friendly, right? And so they, they, they think, oh, you are, uh, they think they are important, right? You, you want to treat them important. And so, uh, you know, speaking Chinese certainly will give you upper hand in the game. Uh, right. So I speak both Mandarin and Cantonese. It, it certainly help me. It won't, it won't hurt me, right? Yeah. And so that, you know, we, you can get so much closer with your customer by speaking the same language. Of course, this is not mandatory. It, it, if you go to Korea, if you go to Japan, uh, you don't necessarily have to speak the language. But the key thing is what is more important is to understand the culture what is in the mind and heart of the customer. Yeah. And so, so language is, is something, it's a plus, it's good to have, but it, it, it may not be must have. Uh, let's put it that way. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so. so, yeah. And, and I don't know, if, um, Dr. Peck, whether we have time for more to answer more questions. So, should I just turn that over to you? Okay. So, we will have one more question. You know? Okay. One more question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Joey's question, maybe. <clears throat> yeah. How will you rate the importance of demand forecasting in your strategic planning? Strate How do you forecast your sales? Yeah. Ah, oh, strategic planning. I, I think it's important too. 
uh, this is something that we learn from school, and it, it's certainly to help you to plan ahead. Uh, for us, you know, I planned this way back when I was 22 years old. I, uh, I don't call it strategic planning, but this is something that I always wanted to do. I want, always wanted to, to, be, to go back to important as for business because this is something that I like. And, and so uh, if you have the passion, if you have the vision, right? Yeah. Uh, then you need to plan, right? It's the third thing you need to have. If you don't plan, you can't do it randomly and you cannot be successful. Yeah. And, and you need to, to plan. And that plan, and it need to not only be, it's, it's not just a, a big vision. It got to be specific. It got to be uh, detailed. It got to be actionable. And so in this business, it's, it's, it's a hang-on business. Uh, yeah. You you gotta have a realistic goal, a realistic plan that you can execute. And so yeah. you know, my advice is to those people who are interested in the international business, uh, if you just find out uh, what you like to do, if this is your passion, go after that. I mean, life is short. When I mm. when I quit the banking job, and I thought, you know, no big deal. If I I, I start my own business. This is always what I wanted to do. You know, if I fail, then I can go back to bank and get another job and no problem, right? Uh, mm. If you have a vision, if you have the passion, go for it. And so yeah, yeah. the plan will be, will be uh, also planned too. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. So at this point, you know, thank you. You know, I would like to take the audience for your attention and questions. And I would like to turn it over to, Ms., to Dr. Peck. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Francisco. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Actually, that I prepared a couple of questions uh, myself, but I'm going to save my questions and probably after the webinar. So once again, thank you so much, uh, Jack and May, for talking to LMU community today out of your very busy schedule. I really appreciate sharing with, you, with us your insights into how to enter and approach um, Asia Pacific market and particularly China. Uh, your presentations were very informative and inspiring. Um, again, Francisco, thank you so much for moderating such an intriguing discussion uh, with the uh, panelists. Finally, I would like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope that uh, you have enjoyed the program. I know there are many undergraduate students uh, among the audience. If you are interested in pursuing your career in international business and international trade in particular, I hope that you will be able to join the webinar uh, next week, next Tuesday, I believe, titled The International Career Pathways, organized by LMU Center for International Business Education. Uh, finally, when you leave this webinar, uh, you will be asked to fill out a brief survey. So I really appreciate if you could do that for, for us. Again, thank you so much, everyone. And then I hope that uh, we'll be able to see uh, each other again uh, for our next webinar. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.